All right, man, peace. So now this is going to be part two to the series on Mr. Charles Barkley, giving his insight and his perspective on the LeBron James and Kevin Durant versus Donald Trump situation. Anyway, they're going to talk about it, and I'm going to chime in. We so appreciate Charles Barkley still hanging with us. Busy weekend for us at ESPN, busy weekend for TNT. Did you want to say I, I wanted to ask something because we were talking about kind of social activism with players and stuff. It seems to me like when I was a kid watching you and Michael Jordan and Larry Bird and these guys, you were Charles Barkley because you spoke your mind. Most guys... Let me say this, since Max Kellerman has brought it up, and I've mentioned this previously on this channel, the only people who were speaking about race during that time period from the early to mid 80s to all the way really almost up until about five or six years ago in the professional sports world was Charles Barkley. Every once in a while, Barry Bonds would get upset and say something. But Charles Barkley was the black athlete who was known for speaking about racial issues in the sports world. So it's interesting now that he's known mostly by the modern day woke Negro and the internet revolutionaries as a quote unquote coon. Because back in the late 80s and early 90s, he was literally the only affluent black athlete who would speak up about race. And like I stated, every once in a while, Barry Bonds would spaz out and say something about the white man. But Charles was the main dude who was doing it. Magic Johnson wasn't doing it. Isaiah Thomas wasn't doing it. Shannon Sharp wasn't doing it. I say all that because many of these more notable black athletes today or former athletes Love to throw Michael Jordan under the bus. Michael Jordan participated in the professional sports world in an era where no one spoke up in regards to racial issues. Because that was the beginning of the athlete em embracing the corporate mindset. In which they were concerned with making sure that they were a viable spokesman for, you know, for a corporation to play a pitch man. That's where Michael Jordan changed the game. And when you have many of these more affluent athletes today who want to involve themselves in quote-unquote social justice like LeBron James, the reason why he can do that is because of the blueprint that Michael Jordan set up where you're signing nine-figure shoe deals and eight-figure endorsement deals with car companies and watch companies and clothing lines. These are all things that Michael Jordan set up that he really originated the blueprint for. Michael Jordan did that. So that's why it's so funny when you when you see many of these modern day two dimensional thinking woke Negroes talk about how Michael Jordan is a sellout and he's this and he's that. No, you know who the person is who sold you out? Your dad. Because you're upset with Michael Jordan because he's not your dad and you're upset that you never knew your dad. Me growing up with a father, I never expected anything from from Michael Jordan or Ken Griffey Jr., or Barry Bonds, or Sugar Ray Leonard, or, or Pernell Whitaker, or Mike Tyson, or Magic Johnson, Isaiah Thomas, Jerry Rice. I never expected anything out of those men other than to do their job on Sunday or, or whatever day or night they were playing. That was their job for me. So that is why I don't run around talking about this person is a coon and that person is a coon. Many of these modern day woke Negroes are desperate for a hug either from the dad they never knew or the liberal Caucasian who they wish would shake their hand, acknowledge them, give them credibility, give them validity. So once again, yes, Charles Barkley was the main so-called black athlete who spoke up about racial issues back then and really the only one. Michael Jordan wasn't doing it because his mindset was on creating the blueprint that so many of these athletes use today. Now, Michael Jordan has his own issues, but in regards to what he's done for the so-called black community proactively and speaking up, no, that's not one of them. I'm not interested in that. Didn't, right? If they, they, they played it more politically down the middle and they were more conscious of it. Nowadays, I get the feeling that guys like LeBron and KD, they'll speak their mind. What, am I right about that? And if so, what's the difference? I think number one. Well, before Charles speaks, let me say the, the reason why LeBron James and Kevin Durant can quote unquote speak up about issues today is number one, they're making enough money to be able to do so. But number two, their corporations are behind them. There is no threat from a Nike or a Gatorade or a Reebok Adidas to tell such and such woke athlete that if you continue to speak on those topics in that way, we're no longer going to use you to endorse our product. Believe me, 
if LeBron James thought that it was a th that it was a threat to his endorsement deals, he would not speak on social issues. I promise you that. If any of his corporate sponsors told him that much of his rhetoric was damaging the bottom line, he would stop. And the proof of that is his relationship with Nike and his reticence on speaking about the sweatshops overseas. As I've told you guys before, the main reason why he advocated for Hillary Clinton was because Donald Trump was going to put a major dent in Nike's revenue by shutting down a lot of the overseas warehouses that Nike was using to make the products. He was going to, he was going to uh, create many issues and roadblocks for all the companies who were outsourcing their, their workforce to overseas demographics, particularly in Southeast Asia. That is why Nike started the quote-unquote equality campaign headlined by their monarch athletes like Serena Williams and pawns like LeBron James and Kevin Durant and all these woke, emotional-ass mama's boys. For me, it's different uh, because growing up in Alabama, it's a big deal to me. The civil rights, social activism, things like that. Growing up right outside of Birmingham because of Montgomery, Selma, things like that. It means a great deal to me. That was my, the greatest person in my life ever was my grandmother. She talked about it nonstop. Uh, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. You hear so many stories from a lot of high-level black athletes who tell you that the best thing that ever happened to them was their grandmother. And a lot of times people will, will shake their head yes and make a solemn face, but that really is an insult to the life that that person was forced to live. When somebody tells you that the greatest thing that ever happened to them in their life was their grandmother, what they're saying is, number one, their dad was most likely not there. Number two, their mother was most likely not that good a mother. Now, in the case of Charles Barkley, he states that he had a great mother and a great grandmother. But in most cases, when people exalt their grandmother, that's what that means. My dad wasn't there and my mom really did not want to do the job of raising me. So she passed me off to my grandmother. The difference now is, number one, guys got their own platform. Number one, they got so much money and power. Agreed. When you're making $100 million a year, you can say what the hell you want to. Yeah, guaranteed. Pretty much. That's You're making five million dollars a year, and you better shut the hell up. I mean, that's not necessarily. But if you're making a hundred million dollars a year, what that means is that your corporation is going to continue to back you. That's what that means. So once again, that's why I bring up the the issue or the aspect of the blueprint that Michael Jordan laid out. You have so many of these low-level, two-dimensional thinking Negroes who always want to talk about Michael Jordan this and Michael Jordan's a sellout and this and that. If it wasn't for Michael Jordan, you wouldn't have a LeBron James. You wouldn't have a whole generation of players today who are making nine figures here and nine figures there. He created that paradigm. He's the reason why they can talk shit today over social media about race, uh, going on and on about topics that they very rarely know anything about. He was different. I mean, I don't think guys understand. Back in, I remember, I'm so old. I remember we were going around the locker room high fiving people the first time somebody made a million dollars. And we're like, we can't believe. I think it was in the, it was obviously, I got to the NBA in 84. But I remember we were going around the locker room high five, and I think it was magic. First guy that made a million dollars. And we were going crazy. Yeah. And now you got guys making 30, 40 million dollars, and that gives you a tremendous amount of power. And also, you have to factor in uh, social media. Social media. I, I, I wanna... Absolutely. Social media has made a, a huge, huge dent into any attempt that the mainstream media has made to stop people from receiving real information, as well as stopping various uh, perspectives and outlooks from other people. Now, in this modern day time, everyone can contribute their viewpoints, their opinions, however informed or uninformed they may be, to the point where there's, there's borderline information overload. Back in the Michael Jordan era, the Magic Johnson era, the print media was king. If you were a columnist back then, you pretty much controlled the flow of information. That's why they call it the fourth estate, because it was almost on the level of being a priesthood. You could affect how people thought. You could affect how they viewed things all through the print media. 
back then, if the government felt like there was a columnist or a reporter who had too much information, you can get them killed. You just bump them off. Nowadays, they can't do that because the, the forms of dispensing information are so vast now. They, there's too many holes in the dam for them to plug. So whatever information leaks now, it's just, it's just got to come out. That's why they have the, the platform known as WikiLeaks, which pretty much keeps the government on its toes. It's just a totally, totally different era. So when people try to compare the two, that's why when Magic Johnson and Isaiah Thomas had that two man sit down where they ended up crying at the end. Right before that, what were they talking about? They were patting themselves on the back for what they did socially. Magic, what did Magic Johnson say? He said, we were doing the same things back then that these players are doing today, but we didn't have social media. What, what, what was he really saying? What he really was saying was, there's no footage of me or Isaiah talking about the white man on TV. But behind closed doors or off camera, we were doing this, 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 and that. He wants the younger generation of so-called black men who are now running their mouth on television about race to know we did our thing too. Because Magic is another person who's, who's worried about how people perceive him. Michael Jordan doesn't care about how he's perceived. So the things that he's done or hasn't done are always going to be kept with him. He's the type of person that if he dies tomorrow, all these people are going to come out of the woodwork talking about what he did or did not do for them. Michael Jordan is going to be a person where a lot of stories are going to come out about him after he's gone, both positive and negative. And that's just life. But my thing is people are overly concerned with what affluent black athletes do or don't do. You should be concerned about what you're doing for yourself and for your family. And if everybody's concerned about that, then they can start being concerned about how they're going to build up their community. But it has to start within, your, within yourself and within your own home. Bottom line. So-called black people are way too concerned with what affluent or rich black athletes are doing for others. Get into the all-star game in just a second, but I will ask you this question, piggybacking off your point. I'm not talking about LeBron and some of the elite players that have money out the wazoo. But you do have guys in my estimation, believe it or not, they appear scared. They don't appear willing, you know, they're guarding, it. they're guarding their brand. They wait to see where the wind blows before taking a position. And they're a bit fearful because they don't want to compromise their brand, despite the fact they already got tens of millions of dollars. You don't have hundreds like LeBron, but you already got tens of millions of dollars. You still got guys scared to speak. Sponsors. Well, I, I, well this is the duplicity of the mainstream liberal media. Stephen A. Smith's little rant right there. Uh, what he stated is exactly why many of these modern day athletes don't want to speak up about issues. Number one, because they oftentimes are uninformed or misinformed. But number two, they understand that people like Stephen A. Smith are waiting out there for them to make statements about topics that most people do not expect them to speak about, like race or politics. And then Stephen A. Smith is going to be the one to tell them, why are you messing up your money? But then when they don't say things, he says, these athletes are scared of losing their money, so they're not speaking up. Well, which one is it? Who are you to tell any athlete that they are not speaking up because they're scared when you're the one who spoke up about domestic abuse or domestic violence and how women should, should be conscious of the fact that sometimes their actions or their words can precipitate a domestic violence situation and you were ran off of your network by a cokehead alcoholic whore named Michelle Beadle, allegedly. That's what she is. <laughs> Allegedly. A cokehead alcoholic whore. She ran you off of your network and you're the number one television personality on ESPN. And she ran you off for two weeks. And you have not spoken about domestic violence in a truthful way since then. And you have the nerve to get on TV and say that the black athlete does not speak on certain topics or issues because they're scared of losing their endorsements. Well, what are you scared of losing? Many of these so-called black athletes, they understand that the liberal media is, is looking for them to say something incendiary so that they can perpetuate a news cycle. They don't care if you lose your job or your contract over that. They hope that you do so that they can develop another news cycle off of that. They don't care. So many of these black athletes 
if they're not as affluent as a LeBron James or someone of that nature who's, who has guaranteed money and guaranteed contract, they're not going to speak. That's why I say what LeBron James says doesn't really impress me. Nothing against the brother. He has a right to say it. What he does impresses me more than what he says. How he contributes to his community, things of that nature, that impresses me. The things that he says about race and Donald Trump, that's normal, emotional ass, mama's boy rhetoric. It doesn't impress me at all. He's another nigga who is, you know, who has his panties all bunched up because of Donald Trump. He's upset because he's another woke athlete. Um, he had an eight year political orgasm when Barack Obama was in the White House because Barack is a big pansexual. And so is LeBron and every other top level Luciferian athlete. They're all pansexuals. OK. For those of you who don't know, yes, LeBron is LeBron is up there dabbling in that shit, too. He is a Luciferian. That's why him and Jay-Z were so close for a while. Um, and then they fell out. Why is that? Because Jay-Z was making sure that LeBron was being ferried through the, the Kabbalah channels that Jay-Z and Madonna preside over. For those of you who don't know, Jay-Z is the top witch in the entertainment industry and Madonna is the top priestess. Okay, they uh, Jay Z ferried LeBron James over to a a top so-called Caucasian Jewish rabbi. I believe his last name was Pinto. What this guy does is he introduces many of these elite athletes to Kabbalah, um, which is just uh, quote unquote Jewish mysticism or uh, Jewish the Jewish version of the Babylonian mystery school system. And it's basically just an introductory method to introduce many of these top athletes into the worship and veneration of Baal. Once they get to a high enough level, that's why you'll notice many of these top black athletes, they start tattooing Hebrew letters on themselves and Hebrew words. Because and basically, LeBron James and his wife found themselves being extorted by this rabbi. I believe his name is Yashiyahu Pinto. But I'll probably delve into that. Maybe I'll do a uh, you know an, an epilogue after this video but let's just get back to what Charles is talking about here you have to understand something also Stephen people they want you to be honest but they only want you to be honest when they agree with you gotcha. I agree with that but that's why it's all the more important to be honest and forthright but most importantly to be informed because when you're informed and you're honest even when people do not think that they agree with you after a while if they have any form of cognitive function, they'll sit back and they'll say, you know what, I never thought of it like that. That's why it's important to speak the truth if you feel like you have the truth. And that's why it's all the more important to be informed on the topics that you speak about. It's not enough to have a mouth. You have to have a brain to go with that mouth. In America, people are taught that they should be able to speak just because they have a mouth. No, you should not. No, you should not. You should speak because, you, you, because you're informed. And you actually plan on your words affecting someone positively. Not just because you want to be heard. A baby wants to be heard. When, a, when an adult speaks, it should be to aid someone. To make them a better person than they were before you open your mouth. That's what having the power to speak is all about as an adult. Like, uh, and, and one thing about this country, one of the reasons it's the greatest country ever, you can say whatever you want to and freedom of speech. But well, yes, but that's also a double-edged sword. That's a double-edged sword. Please understand that so-called freedom of speech was not set up for what we have here today. If they knew back in the 1780s what America would be like today, they would have said to themselves, you know what, let's moderate this, <laughs> let's moderate this bill on freedom of speech. You know, what they call the Bill of Rights would have been com completely amended, among other things. They would have amended. But they wanted America to be a haven for witchcraft. That's truly what America was set up for. People like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, these men were all high level witches, Luciferians. They wanted America to be a haven for witches. That's what the freedom of religion was all about. Because back in Europe, in Britain, where many of those men came from or their ancestry came from, if you did many of the things back in Britain that they were doing here in America, they would be burned alive. All right. So that's truly why they ended up here in the first place. They were practicing witchcraft and many of them were kicked out of Britain. And when they landed here, 
they saw that they had the freedoms to do certain things that they did not have back in the quote unquote mother country. This is what many of these laws and provisions to preserve freedom were set up for, so that they would be able to worship and venerate Baal, Asar, Pan, Bacchus. That's why when you finally get to the mid to late 1800s, when they come out to the West Coast, to California, they set up Hollywood, which was meant to be a, a venue, uh, a mechanism to create a portal to promote, propagate their beliefs to the masses. That's why it's called Hollywood. Like I had a brother come and ask me, well, it was called Hollywood before they set up the entertainment industry there. Why is that? You know, when you when you look up the origin of the term Hollywood, it gives you this BS cockamamie story about an Asian man who was carrying uh, pieces of, of, of wood that he chopped down. And supposedly the originator for the name Hollywood asked the Asian man what he was doing. And, and he said, Harry Wood. <laughs> And allegedly, that's the reason why they named that region Hollywood. That's nonsense. That area was called Hollywood in remembrance of the Holly King. The Holly King is talking about Nimrod. You had two kings, the Oak King and the Holly King. The Oak King is Cush, or as he's known as Pan or Sir Nunos. The Holly King is talking about Asar right, or Osiris. He's also known as the God of Vegetation. The evergreen God. Right? In, in his incarnation as the sun, he's known as Haru or Apollo or Tammuz or Bacchus, the God of vegetation, God of wine, uh, God of acting, the theater. Okay? So that's how that was all set up. Even though, even though people have talked about how America was set up for freedom of speech, it wasn't set up for what is going on today. If they knew that black people would be running around here, running their mouths and all that, they would not have allowed that provision. <laughs> Believe me. But now, you know, they've made their bed. They pretty much have to lie in it. That's why this is modern day Babylon. This is the land of confusion. The term Babylon means confused or confusion. They want you to be honest, but they only want you to be honest when they agree with you. And COVID's I agree. So we interviewed Kobe a couple of weeks ago. He says, I don't tell guys what to say or what to do. Everybody is not comfortable talking on all these issues. And first of all, and first of all let me say this. A lot of these guys are unqualified. That's no question. Oh, absolutely. And one can say that you're unqualified and so is Stephen A. Smith. I mean, let's be for real. What qualifies either one of you guys to speak about race? We already know what both of you guys want. You're both boule. You want to hide the fact that you're getting the hug that the masses of liberal blacks wish that they were getting from the liberal Caucasian. Stephen A. Smith and Charles Barkley are closer to getting that hug than most of the internet revolutionaries and liberal blacks are. So they have less to be mad about. Their job is to act as a buffer between the black masses and the elite level Caucasians. That's why they're the boule. The term boule means the advisor to the king. You know, I, uh, I think Nick Saban, uh, I love my Auburn Tigers, but I think Nick Saban is the greatest college football coach ever. He had me come speak to that team before the season started. And the one thing I told those young guys, uh, this was right uh, at the beginning of the season. I said, you guys got a totally different life to me. I said, you guys are 18 years old. And this was right after Charlottesville. Uh, then we had the National Anthem thing. I said, when I was 18, I don't know how I would react if somebody said, Hey, Charles, what do you think about Charlottesville? Charles, what do you think about the National Anthem? I think guys have to be very careful if they're in, in, uh, old enough, intelligent enough, or smart enough to answer some of these questions. Just because they pay you millions of dollars, everybody is not qualified to speak on these Same. different things. I agree, sir. And uh, I agree wholeheartedly. And that's very well put by Charles. Unfortunately, that sentiment... Also, it was also in regards to him as well, because he, he's not qualified to speak on a lot of this shit either. But they like asking him because they know that Charles is going to give the best answer that he can give. And when it comes to sports analysts, he probably gives the best answers on race of anybody. And that's not really saying much because he's not that informed, but at least he understands that everyone else, for the most part, is not informed. So you should not put pressure on so-called black athletes to speak out about race. That is why. Last year, when everybody was in a furor over Colin Kaepernick and they tried to set up many of these other black athletes like Cam Newton to ask them what they thought about Colin Kaepernick, they were setting them up. 
Remember when Cam refused to speak about the Colin Kaepernick protests and all, all the internet revolutionaries got mad. They called him a sellout. Michael Vick was a sellout. Everybody was a sellout because Colin Kaepernick was supposed to be leading the revolution. Now, a year and a half later, he's gone and these niggas still have no plan. All they do is talk shit all damn day. Because it's easier to look at Colin Kaepernick and blame the NFL owners for not allowing him in the NFL than it is to put down the weed and um, inform yourself and try to put yourself and your family in, in a better position, in an advantageous position. It's easier to look at Colin Kaepernick and say, good, you do it for me and I'll be a cheerleader. And when it doesn't work, which, is, which it was never going to work because you had no end game, then we'll just sit back and complain about the cracker again. Believe me, um, there will be a time to talk about the so-called Caucasian. But there is so much to do in the intermediary. It's like talking about cleaning up your front yard or, or the, the, the land across the street and your house is in shambles. You have to get your house together before you do anything with the property across the street. So, it is what it is. Fair. Let me transition because I want to get back to... No, let's not transition. That, that's pretty much the topic on that issue. But anyway, peace. All right, man, peace. So as I stated earlier in the video, I decided to make an epilogue with some pictorial evidence just to substantiate many of the statements that I made pertaining to Mr. LeBron James and his affiliations. As I stated, and as you can see here, he's holding hands in prayer. <laughs> Looked like forced prayer. With a rabbi named Yeshiyahu Pinto. And you guys can look him up. I can't exactly remember how to spell his name. But I believe it's Y-E-S-H-A-Y-A-H-U. Last name Pinto. And as you can see by looking at LeBron James's face here. He's not happy to be involved in what he's involved in. Clearly he's been caught between a rock and a hard place. Because of some other affiliations that he made in the industry who introduced him to Mr. Yeshiyahu Pinto. Uh, the person who introduced LeBron James to this man is Jay-Z. For those of you who remember, in the early 2010s, maybe even the late 2000s, Jay-Z and LeBron James became closely affiliated. You see them photographed a lot together. Jay-Z would always go out of his way to gesture or motion to LeBron Whenever the Cleveland Cavaliers or the Miami Heat would play the Brooklyn Nets. And LeBron James would reciprocate. I think they even did a video together. One of those videos I think they did together or commercials that Jay-Z was involved in. He had LeBron in the video. Much was made about Beyonce staring down LeBron. Point being is this. Jay-Z's job as the top witch in the music industry along with Madonna, who's the high priestess, is to see how many affluent athletes and entertainers they can recruit into the Kabbalah Center. Because the Kabbalah Center is where many of these athletes first get introduced into the veneration and the worship of Baal, who is the god of the, the pseudo-Jewish belief system known as the Kabbalah which is just the Babylonian mystery school system, the Jewish version. It's where they learn about the quote-unquote tree of life, which is actually a pathway to learn how to attain to a level of godhood that requires pansexuality, ritual sacrifice, and, and, and chanting and the worship of Baal, cannibalism, so on and so forth. A lot of it might sound a bit outlandish, but when you understand what's going on in the upper levels of the entertainment industry and the world at large, it becomes very clear and it becomes very obvious. But once again, when you look at Mr. LeBron James's face here, you can see that he's very unhappy. And also, for those of you who don't know, uh, another athlete that had gotten tangled up in Jay-Z's web was Mr. Alex Rodriguez. Alex Rodriguez was another athlete who at one time you see palling around with Jay-Z a lot. See, they use Jay-Z because they know that Jay-Z has a lot of sway. He holds a lot of sway with many of these top athletes because most athletes, they want to be rappers. And a lot of rappers, they want to be athletes. Everybody knows that. So they use Jay-Z to try to recruit many of these athletes. And then what happens is these athletes end up getting extorted. 
they end up getting harassed to the point where many of them leave cities to try to get away from the harassment. And supposedly, that was one of the reasons why LeBron decided that he was going to leave Miami. Because his house was put under surveillance, allegedly, by the Kabbalah Center. As was Alex Rodriguez's house. They were the ones who caused the divorce between Alex Rodriguez and his wife. Because they had many of their representatives coming, all, coming into their homes anytime they wanted to. And notice, when Alex Rodriguez finally... Um, separated from his wife who was he linked to he's linked to madonna he's also linked to cameron diaz who's another plant in the industry whose job it basically is to see who she can recruit into the kabbalah center but a lot of these people are into the kabbalah now spike lee he's heavy into the kabbalah and all these people that you see who get heavily involved in kabbalah they're all pansexual because that goes part and parcel to it and with it and that's why I stated that LeBron James, yeah, he's a pansexual, right? Allegedly. Everything I'm saying in this video is alleged, okay? <laughs> it's definitely all alleged. <laughs> well, for many of you brothers that are in the knowledge, it's important for you to be able to correlate things with a spiritual eye. Because most of these carnal, what I call two-dimensional thinkers... You know, a lot of the so-called pro-blacks and the internet revolutionaries, they'll say things like, oh, whenever a black person get famous, y'all going to say that they in the Illuminati. Y'all hate him because, blah, blah, blah. because that's, that's how they operate. A lot of our people have been relegated to useless eater mentality, meaning they don't understand what's going on around them. It's very easy to program them. It's very easy to put a battery in the back of the majority of so-called black people. Very easy. And once again, that's to take nothing away from Mr. LeBron James. He's an incredible athlete. He does great things for his community. But a lot of that also goes into feeding the cult of personality. And it's not to say that he's not sincere, but he's definitely caught up in and embroiled in a lot of very nefarious situations. He has a lot of, of bad connections. Okay? And as you can see here, he does not want to be there. And as I already stated... Allegedly, one of the reasons why he fled Miami was because at the behest of his wife, she no longer wanted to be subjected to the harassment of the quote unquote Kabbalah Center. Now, I don't know if they're still involved with them at all. But as I stated, that's why you'll notice many of these affluent black entertainers, particularly in basketball. You'll always see them tattooing some type of Hebrew letter on themselves or they're talking about how they're how they're trying to learn Hebrew, but they're 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 embracing the Hasidic form of Judaism. That's why, whether it's Shaq or many of these other uh, more affluent basketball players, they, they're being introduced slowly into the Kabbalah Center. All right, so just watch out for that. Here's Jay-Z with Madonna. As I stated, Jay-Z is the high priest of the entertainment industry in regards to the, to the craft Madonna is the high priestess. They're very familiar with each other. They, uh, they also, as I stated, they engage in cannibalism. And they, they like to ritualize it with what they call spirit cooking. Where they do a facsimile of a human body being cooked and they act like they're eating it. Look up an artist by the name, I believe her name is Marina Abramovich. First name M-A-R-I-N-A, -A, last name a is an apple, B is in boy, R A, M is in Michael, O, V is in Victor, I C. She's one of the favorite artists of the Luciferian world because she likes to she likes to hold a lot of ritualistic seances where she prepares a uh, a food item that looks like a human body and they eat it. Lady Gaga attends many of her performances. Uh, John Podesta, who was heavily involved in the campaign of Hillary Clinton, as well as her, Hillary Clinton is involved in it as well. OK, so these are the connections that are associated with Mr. LeBron James. And also, once again, please remember that LeBron James helped campaign for Hillary Clinton. Like I tell you, brothers, everything is connected. Also, just pay attention to how everybody there is wearing all black. Once again, that is for Baal, a.k.a. Saturn or Kronos. What was Baal known for? Eating children. 
That's what he was known for. Uh, even in the the mythological story of Kronos, it states that he ate his own children. Okay, so please pay very close attention to the associations and the affiliations of many of these top uh, entities in the entertainment industry. Also, LeBron, I mentioned this before, LeBron James has the, the Boulay Sphinx tatted on his chest. So they have a lot of plans for him. Now, I believe that this photo was taken at the same function because it seems that Madonna has on the same outfit. As you can see also, the other uh, mind-controlled monarch children, beta program sex kittens. <laughs> Alicia Keys, Beyonce, uh, Rihanna, three biggest whores in the industry. No disrespect to them, but three biggest whores in the industry, or three of the bigger whores in the industry, allegedly. Um, they are facsimiles of the mother goddess principle. Sometimes they take on the energy of Kali, the destroyer goddess, the warrior goddess. Sometimes they take on the energy of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. And sometimes they take on the energy of Aphrodite slash Venus, who is the sex goddess. All right. Now, the boxer Adrian Broner, for those of you who remember, he turned down signing to Rock Nation. And in one of his rants, he, he said... F Jay Z and F Rihanna's pussy. In other words, Jay Z had offered Rihanna to Adrian Broner in exchange for signing with Rock Nation because Jay Z pimps out Rihanna as well as Rita Ora. Right? Allegedly. He pimps them out though because he has their keys. Uh, as Jay Z states, he is the modern day Frank Sinatra. He has the keys for a lot of these top level singers in the industry. He can tell them what to do. All right. And I already did a video on Alicia Keys. Alicia Keys, she's a uh, she's she's a program multiple. And as is as is Beyonce as well. Beyonce is diamond level. She's on the level of Madonna. Beyonce did a video. I'm trying to remember what the name of the video was where it showed her um going through many of her alter personalities. If I remember it, I'll bring it up. But I believe that she had on the um, the leopard print, as well as the the uh, the green emerald color. If I remember what that video was, I'll go through it. But all, all these people are are just basically human androids. That's all they are. Here goes Madonna and real life get out victim Kanye West. <laughs> This brother's been in the quote-unquote sunken place for years now, never to return. Okay, Kanye West, as you knew him back in the mid-2000s, will never be the same again. He will never return. They will let him out every once in a while to make the public think that he's still the same person, but he's, he's gone, he, and he's been gone, and he's not coming back. Okay, Once again, that film, Get Out, was meant to be a satire of what's actually going on in the entertainment industry. But I'll cover that later on. And yes, Madonna is one of his handlers. When you're at that level like a Madonna and Jay-Z, they have the keys for a lot of these people. Madonna has ritualistic sex with a lot of these people. That's why she's known as Madonna. That's, that's, no, that is basically an allusion to her being the mother goddess. Here we have Jay-Z and the pansexual Jamie Foxx, uh, a plant in the industry. He was brought into the industry via the, the uh, MK Asset Farm, known as In Living Color. It's where you get the Wayans brothers, who are assets, as well as Mr. Jim Carrey, who's another uh, monarch child, MK Ultra program entertainer. Same thing with Jamie Foxx. Now... The interesting thing about Jamie Foxx and Jay-Z is that they were both mentioned by Foxy Brown as, as being pansexual. Jamie Foxx, I mentioned before, is heavily into zoophilia, meaning having sex with animals. And Foxy Brown stated that she had sex with Jay-Z. This is according to her. She had sex with Jay-Z and Jamie Foxx came in the room and she was forced to get gang banged by the both of them 
Okay, she did not know that Jamie Foxx was there. But while she was engaging in sexual intercourse with Jay-Z, Jamie Foxx entered the room and she was put in a position where she was forced to engage in intercourse with both of them. This is allegedly according to her statements. All right. And let me also say before I forget in regards to the quote unquote Jesus piece that you'll oftentimes see many of these artists wear. That is not for Christ. That is not for quote unquote Jesus. That is for Baal. All right. So once again, you see Jay-Z rocking the all black. That's for Saturn, a.k.a. Baal, Kronos, whatever you want to call him, Nimrod. That is who that is who he is uh, trying to associate himself with. That's who he's trying to court the energies of when he dresses like that. All black is the is the color for Asar, or Osiris, who is the god of the Kabbalah, the god of the tree of life, as they call it, that that tree of life. You know where you can see the tree of life get alluded to also? If you ever seen the first Thor movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there's a scene where Thor sits down with uh, his girlfriend, played by Natalie Portman, another program multiple, and he's trying to explain the tree of life to her, what he calls what they call the nine realms. And he points to his planet. His planet is, of course, Asgard, as they call it, from Norse mythology. But that's actually talking about the planet Saturn. Okay? I'll probably delve deeper into this in another video. But they, they worship Saturn. And they call it by different names. Krypton, Asgard. It's also the planet where E.T. came from. They just don't get that explicit in the movie. But that that's the point of the quote-unquote tree of life is... They're trying to navigate themselves through the, through the conduits of the tree of life to godhood. They believe that they're all gods. Okay, But that is what the so-called Jesus piece or that, that chain represents. Because you'll see it, all the rappers wear it. When you see the rappers wearing it, they're wearing it for Baal. Or many of the athletes also. They worship Baal. Many of your top level athletes, they're Baal worshippers. Whether you're talking about uh, Floyd Mayweather, Michael Jordan, you name them. Tiger Woods. They venerate Baal. So now that brings us back to Mr. LeBron James and his association with Jay-Z. Uh, as I laid out in the video, yes, LeBron is a Luciferian. And therefore, he has to engage in and indulge in the practices of the Luciferians. And that includes pansexuality. That includes the veneration of Baal. That's why I wanted to lead this little epilogue with him holding the hands of the rabbi, even though it's against his will. But you guys just pay very close attention to those things, all right? Anyway, peace.